Welcome, welcome. We're always so pleased when you choose to spend your um, evenings with us at the Durham County Library. I'm Joanne Abel, the Humanities Programming Coordinator. And those of you that come to our programs, um, welcome back. And those that are, are new, we hope that you'll come to more of them. Um, this is our brochure of the upcoming programs. I'm only going to mention one. It's a quick commercial tonight. This Thursday, we're having an amazing program called 40 Days and 40 Nights. It's on the eighth anniversary of Katrina. And the official photographer for the Port of New Orleans has done a really wonderful slideshow. And he will come and talk about it. And if you can't make the program, upstairs in the second floor gallery, we have a sample of his works that you can see. So we hope you'll make that. It will be here at the main library at 7 on Thursday. And also, my other commercial is all of the programs are brought to you by the Durham Library Foundation. And we're in a fundraising phase now. We've already raised half of our $1.5 that we want to raise. And we're saying it takes people of all stripes to make a good library, or great library. So pick up a bookmark or a brochure or ask me about it later. Now, we've, we are very happy about our Bullish on Durham series. And we'd like to focus on different um, things in Durham. And my coworker, Alice Sharp, had met Dr. Rohi and thought he would be fabulous to come and talk to us about Research Triangle Park because I don't know anything about the history very much. So he is the, Dr. Rohi is the Kerry B. Boschemer Distinguished Professor of City and Regional Planning and the Director of the Center for Urban and Regional Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received his PhD from Penn State University and is an award-winning author who has written several books and over 60 journal articles on topics of housing, community development, policy, and practice. His research has been supported by a number of organizations, including the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and we have his most recent book. We don't have a lot of copies, so if you're interested after the questions, run back and buy you a copy. If you don't get one, it is available at Regulator and other bookstores. So without any further ado, welcome with me, Dr. William Rohi. Thank you. Nice. Well, uh, first of all, can you hear me well? OK. Uh, second of all, thank you all for coming. This is a terrific audience. Uh, hopefully, you'll have lots of uh, questions. I'll try to keep it to 45 minutes at the most, and then we'll have a chance for discussion. And you can challenge me on something I said, or if some of you have had some experience with the park, uh, you can add to my knowledge, possibly. And I'd also like to thank Joanna and the staff of the library for setting this up. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to have this opportunity to come and talk to you this evening. Um, I thought I'd have my computer right here that I'd be able to look at it. Uh, turns out the plug is way over there. Uh, so uh, normally, I love to keep really good eye contact with my audience, but I'm going to probably have to do some double takes up on the screen there uh, to follow uh, the presentation. Um, in the city planning field, we talk about transformative developments. Uh, those are the really special ones that really changed the trajectory and the future of a place. The RTP, Research Triangle Park, is in fact one of those transformative investments. I don't know how uh, long each of you have been here, uh, but you certainly would not have recognized this place uh, back in the 19, early 1950s uh, when people came up with the idea for the park. Uh, it was a totally different place. Uh, it was, uh, as I say in a second in part of the presentation, it was off people's radar screens. Uh, yes, pe people heard about Raleigh and other parts of the country. Durham, maybe because of the tobacco. Chapel Hill, maybe if they were university types. But really, this was, uh, I have to say, sort of a, an insignificant uh, metropolitan area. It was a very tiny metropolitan area. And over that period of time, as you'll see uh, in some of these slides, I mean, we have just blossomed. We've been one of the fastest growing places in the country. And it's clear to me that the Research Triangle Park was really central in that whole growth trajectory and making this place uh, the way it is today. 
Now having said that, the park is over 50 years old now. It was designed uh, back in a different era. And uh, some people have called it a dinosaur. Uh, people who are thinking about sustainable development look at the park and say, oh my god, are you kidding? You have to drive everywhere. You have to drive to it, and then you have to drive everywhere to get around. And then if you want to go to lunch, you have to get back in the car and drive again. You can't find it. It's like, you know, it's funny people come to visit me and they say, oh yeah, I, I want to go out and I want to drive around the Research Triangle Park and see it. And I say, well, you can try, but <laughs> all you'll see is a bunch of signs along the road. You can't see anything. Um, so that and, and a variety of, of other limitations means that the park itself, uh, this is not lost on the, the people who um, run the park, and I'll describe who those people are. Uh, they understand this, they get this, and they've recently come up with a new plan to try to bring the park into what we might call the 21st century, uh, to try to add density, to add some there there, uh, to try to, to diversify uh, the activities out there, actually bring some housing, radical, uh, bring some housing into the park, which has really never had housing. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of the park, uh, how it came about, and then I'm going to talk about where it is today and what they're trying to do to uh, bring it up to the modern age. Okay. All right, so uh, what led to the creation of the RTP? What was the thinking behind the development model, the very low density development model. What impact, <coughs> excuse me, what impacts has the park had on the metropolitan area? What are the major challenges faced by the park today? <coughs> excuse me. And then how are those challenges being addressed? That's the agenda <coughs> that I'm going to pursue this evening. So let me break, take you back to, to the early 1950s. Uh, North Carolina uh, was heavily dependent on three major industries, agriculture, textiles, and furniture. And a lot of the agriculture, of course, was tobacco, a la Durham. The whole history of Durham is the history of, of tobacco in, in the United States. But those three industries were in decline. It was clear the handwriting was on the wall. Those were not going to be industries that were going to create jobs in the future. And this state and this metropolitan area needed a new reason to exist. The per capita income of people in North Carolina was two-thirds of that of the country. It's now, we're, we're now at least uh, recently up to the per capita income. At one point, we were well above the capita income. I have those uh, figures for you in a second. There was a brain drain from the area. So we had these three um, not quite as big and quite as prestigious universities as we think of them today, but we still had NC State, we still had Duke, and we still had UNC Chapel Hill that were turning out a lot of scientists, a lot of technical people, and also a lot of uh, historians and, and the like. But particularly for the science-based people, there was no jobs to be had in North Carolina. I'm exaggerating. Very few jobs in North Carolina for people with those kind of uh, technical skills. So they would graduate, they would get on the train, and they would head to New York, Chicago, uh, other places in order to find employment. So that was um, obviously very disappointing to people in the state, not only the moms and dads of these students who had their sons and daughters, thank you so much, uh, heading off into the wild blue yonder, uh, but also uh, for the economic development of the state to be losing this in incredible res resource, this talent, and uh, shipping it out to, to other places. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, the area was just not on anybody's radar screen. 
the idea that a corporation like IBM or Cisco Systems uh, would come here, it was why? Uh, it was the South, uh, even though it was a little bit more progressive South, it was still the South. And you had very few Fortune 500 companies. Uh, again, there was really not a whole lot of reason for a big company to move to North Carolina. So that was the state of affairs in the 1950s. Um, <clears throat> little slide of some of the founding fathers of the park uh, who realized that they wanted to create a new place to create jobs, to support the universities, and, and to improve the quality of life in North Carolina. Now, <clears throat> the creation story, if you will, uh, there's a lot of disagreement as to what, how important the role of different people uh, were in the development of the park. So this is my version of it based on my own reading of the material. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the critical person here, and he was influenced by others, no doubt, but the, it was an entrepreneur named Romeo Guest, and he was out of Greensboro, and his business was basically building textile mills. So people like uh, the, the big textile magnets would say, I want a new bill, uh, I want a new mill, Romeo, would you build it for me? So he was, was all built to order kind of textile mills. Well, he realized that business model was not gonna work for him in the future. So he's looking around for another business model. He sees the, realizes that we have three, at that time, up and coming universities. And he realizes that, well, maybe he could build plants or research facilities for companies that want to hire the local talent. And he sits down with some other folks, they look at a map, and Romeo apparently says, look, we have a research triangle here. And he circles Duke and circles UNC and NC State and draws a triangle. And that's apparently where the coin, the, the term, the research triangle was coined. So <clears throat> he, uh, he and then others who jumped on this idea uh, went to the governor um, uh, and convinced him uh, to create an exploratory commission, which you see here was created in 1955 and headed by a gentleman named uh, Robert Haynes, who was the CEO of Wachovia Bank. And so shortly after that, they decided, well, yeah, this thing, this thing might actually work. It's a bit of a wild flyer, but let's, let's continue to develop it. They hired a, a guy named George Simpson, uh, who was a sociology professor at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, to act uh, to be the first executive director of this committee. And uh, he and others then uh, decided that the best way to build this research park was to interest a big moneyed developer or somebody with, not a developer, but somebody that had a lot of money and who saw this as a profit-making venture. So uh, Governor uh, uh, Luther at the time, Luther Hodges, uh, had some connections uh, actually, it, was the, uh, it wasn't the Governor Hodges, it was the head of the uh, Department of Commerce, with two Hodgeses at the time, who knew a guy uh, named uh, Carl Robbins, who was a textile mill executive who moved to New York to retire, uh, and uh, convinced him to in in invest a million dollars in land, the purchase of land, for this new park. So he was on board, he wrote him an initial check for a quarter million, and they went out and started buying land between Durham and Raleigh, uh, right next to what was, a was a sort of the beginnings of what we considered the uh, uh, RDU airport uh, to be today. It was a very small uh, airport, but right next to the airport, uh, halfway between Durham, roughly halfway between Durham and Raleigh. Um, <clears throat> Robbins, however, so they started buying land secretly. Uh, and 
they amassed 4,000 acres of land. Uh, but Robbins got cold feet. He wanted other people to invest in this venture, and he, did, he wasn't getting investors. He was hoping that he wouldn't really have to put up the whole million, that uh, other people would come in and sort of buy shares, and they weren't coming in. And, and so he got cold feet and said, look, uh, I, uh, I don't, I'm not going to actually give you any more money for this. So uh, things looked bad. Could have gone south, so to speak. Uh, and along then comes, and, and uh, Mr. Haynes then actually was having some health problems, and he retired. And the new head of the Wachovia Bank, a gentleman named Archie Davis, they asked him to take it over, and he said, yeah, I'll take it over, but you know what? This, this whole private enterprise model, it doesn't make sense to me. He said, I'll take it over, but what I want to do is I want to turn this into a nonprofit venture. So uh, you think about how radical that idea was. You can't get people to invest in it because they don't believe in it, but we're just going to get people to donate money. All right? That was the idea. We're going to get people to donate money. Now he's well connected. He's the head of Walk Over Your Bank. He goes to his friends and other interested parties and says, this is good for North Carolina. It's not good for the Durham County or Wake County. It's good for North Carolina. And he was right about that. So most of the uh, people who ponied up 50,000, 100,000 were people from Greensboro, Winston-Salem. And so a lot of the or original investors were not people in the triangle to some extent because the money wasn't in the triangle. The money at that time was in Greensboro. The money was in Winston-Salem. So in a very short period of time, he raised uh, uh, $1.25 million. They bought out the Pinelands Company, which was Robbins's company, and they turned it into a nonprofit uh, organization. They created what's called the Research Triangle Foundation, that now, uh, from the beginning to now, uh, manages the park. And they were, they were off and running. Um, I'll catch up with my notes here. So, uh, I'm sorry, 1.4 million is what, uh, as it says there, what Archie Davis raised. And uh, a quarter million of that was raised for the creation of RTI, the Research Triangle Institute. And this was an interesting call because part of what they wanted to do with this park, part of the way that they sold the park was companies come on down and we're going to give you access to the faculty and these great students that we're producing at these three major universities. In order to do that, they had to get the universities to buy into this model. Universities had to be supportive of it. Right? Otherwise, the companies would come down, the universities would say, I don't have time for you guys. So um, one of the ways that they, so the universities would say, well, what's really in it for us? And how are we going to interact with these companies? And they were very skeptical. Before I finish that point, let me tell you this one vignette that uh, I think is, is frankly hilarious. So um, Romeo Guest is talking to a bunch of academics back in 1955 or so, and explaining to him, to them, what his concept was. And uh, a, uh, one of the people who was with the general administration at the time stopped him and said, now Romeo, let me see if I understand this correctly. So you want us to be the prostitutes and you're going to be the pimp. <laughs> Literally, quoted, quoted. He got, he got quoted in the book, in the, my book, it's quoted. Uh, I, and I got it from somebody else who quoted it from somebody else. But uh, the, the point is that there was tremendous skepticism among the universities to, to get involved, get their hands dirty, right, to, to get into the business part of science. At that time, and it's changed radically at the universities today, there was this ivory tower mentality we do pure science, and, and anybody that did applied science was like second class. 
Now it's like the applied scientists, everybody's falling all over them because they're making a lot of money and pumping some of that back into the universities. Uh, back then it wasn't, uh, wasn't an issue. But anyway, uh, the point is that the Research Triangle Institute was seen as kind of a, a, a meeting place for the businesses and for the academics. And in fact, in many instances, RTI does bring those people together. I've, over the years, done some consulting uh, with people at, at RTI and others have as well. We do joint contracts, although, frankly, uh, I think all the universities feel in the end that they siphon, the RTI siphons off more work than uh, they like. Some of that work they would like to go to the universities rather than to RTI. Our RTI now is, uh, last time I looked, I think it was about 700,000 a year in research contracts, which is pretty close to what UNC Chapel Hill does. So um, it's, it's a pretty amazing organization. Anyway, uh, fast forward, um, the park is founded. Uh, Luther Hodges um, announces it in 1957. A couple of small companies move in. RTI uh, builds a building. Not much there at all. They continue to try to market it. Uh, until 1965 when the big break comes, two big breaks come. First is uh, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences uh, makes the announcement that they're going to move to the Research Triangle Park, and that's a whole story about Terry Sanford uh, giving the uh, inauguration, not inauguration speech, the nomination speech, thank you, uh, for John Kennedy and bringing the South behind Kennedy. And so the, the, the idea is, the notion is that this was payback, that we're going to, so Kennedy told uh, NIHS, you are going to the Research Triangle Park, period. Uh, the other big one was uh, IBM. So IBM, they've been working on IBM for a couple of years, and IBM said, yes, we're coming to the park. Once that happened, the attention of the corporate America really started to focus in on the RTP. Well, wh why is uh, IBM going there? They must know something we don't know. And, and they did. They knew it was uh, low labor costs. They knew it was high quality of life. And they knew that this model, uh, this research triangle model, gave them these big campuses, which at that time was something very attractive uh, to, to these businesses. Okay, so. That is a brief history of uh, the park. Let's see. Um, now, what was the, the thinking behind the development model? Uh, why do we have uh, this sprawling 7,000, I said it was originally 4,000, they added another 3,000 acres, so it's 7,000 acres of land with only, only 37 thousand employees on it. So if you think about the math there, not many employees per, per acre, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of pitiful how low density it is. Um, so, but the idea was, and I, and I got a chance to interview Pearson Stewart, who was the chief, one of the chief planners for the park before he passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, he, he verified a lot of this, uh, for me. And that is they wanted, at the time, everybody was moving to the suburbs. People were looking for bucolic uh, environments, trees, open space, fresh air. The idea was not only are we going to uh, give them that in, in terms of housing, we're going to give them a work environment like that. They're going to look out their windows and they're going to see trees and it's going to be, you know, beautiful, and, and that was a big part of it. The other piece of it, though, uh, was that on these big campuses, they could essentially have a lot more control over their employees. Employees come in the morning, and there was no place for them to go for lunch originally, so they went to the lunch cafeteria. Well, you don't get hung up in the lunch cafeteria, and you're not doing your you know, double uh, scotch at lunch in, 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 in the company cafeteria. 
you know, it's kind of the food is all right, but you eat and you get back to work. So there was that aspect to it. But the other aspect to it was they didn't want their employees fraternizing with the competition. And this is something that's really changed quite dramatically in some businesses. And I think to get, this gets oversold sometimes. Oh, yeah, everybody wants to have their employees interacting. Well, you know, sometimes, but sometimes they don't. So I think that, gets, that issue gets oversold. But anyway, those, those two things really uh, were underpinning of this idea of this very large uh, uh, lot, these very large lots. So what did they uh, put in their restrictive covenants? Minimum lot size, eight acres. That's a pretty big hunk of land. Uh, only 15% of any lot could be built upon. And the original covenant said and only a total of 30% can be disturbed. So in terms of parking lots and uh, uh, roads around the site and so on, 70% of it had to be left in its pristine state. 150-foot minimum setbacks from the road and 100-foot setbacks from the other property lines. Um, the original covenants did not allow for housing and provided a little tiny what they call service area, uh, which is where, I'm not sure what the hotel is, it used to be called the Governor's Inn. I don't know what it's called now. Still Governor's Inn? Radisson. 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 Uh, and, you know, a little bank and a couple of other, little, I mean, that, that was it. Uh, that was their service area. That was the mixed use. So it was like you know, 98% uh, offices and uh, labs and, and so on, and like 2%, maybe not even that much, uh, a little service park. So it's the urban equivalent of a monoculture, research offices, period. You want to get something to eat, you got to drive you know, 20 minutes in one direction or another. Uh, you you, you want to buy a place? To stay, you got to you know, go to North Raleigh. And so North Raleigh was the first place that uh, most of the park employees uh, settled because there was good road access from North Raleigh down the, the uh, uh, what's now 440 uh, to 55 and then out on, uh, no, 54 and then out on 54. So good as, good as relative, huh? And then 40. 40 was put through in, uh, in the early 70s, uh, and then they had basically a four-lane highway all the way through from North Raleigh to uh, RTP. Um, okay, now here was a critical factor, too. The development model was selling parcels of land, and this is something that's come back uh, 50 years later maybe they wouldn't have done it if they knew what they know now. So, and there's two reasons for that. One is, so all those companies out there, they own the land, right? I mean, they have full title to the land. They can sell it to whoever they want. Of course, whoever buys it has to uh, conform to the covenants. Um, and that was also the way that the Research Triangle Foundation would fund itself through this sale, sale of land. So while the land was selling, they had plenty of money for the staff and for management and planning and so on. Now, uh, they only have about, uh, I've heard every, anywhere from 400 to 700 acres left, and none of that's been selling very, uh, very well, so uh, they have a funding crisis. How are we gonna fund our staff out there? So for those two reasons, uh, the choice to sell rather than lease property uh, was pretty important. All right, a couple pictures then. Uh, here's uh, Governor Hodges um, in uh, making the announcement uh, that the park is open for business. Um, this is an early shot of uh, IBM, and you see uh, the incredible amount of nothingness uh, in, in the area, a uh, couple of big one-story buildings, uh, parking lots, and just trees and little, you know, clear-cut areas, and that was basically the park in the 60s. This was the, the, the iconic, and it's still there, uh, Burroughs Welcome Building, uh, 
uh, one of the first pharmaceutical companies to come. I think they came in 72, 71, 72. Now uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, owns that building. So uh, fast forward to today, the research uh, triangle today. 7,000 acres of land, largest research park in the country. Uh, 22 million square feet of floor space, which sounds like a lot, but not on 7,000 acres. Uh, 170 firms, 38,000 employees, listing the, the major companies there. IBM is still the, the largest. I think they have about 12,000. GlaxoSmithKline is uh, down to about 5,000. Uh, annual salaries of approximately $2.7 billion. So imagine what that does in terms of supporting uh, businesses in uh, Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill, other places, Cary, of course. Uh, here's the list of the uh, major types of companies. This has diversified quite a bit uh, over the years. One other quick note about the original concept. The original concept was it was going to be limited to research facilities, period. And then IBM and some of the other companies early on said, now wait, we want to bring manufacturing with our research. So they, they loosened the covenants and said, okay, yeah, you can do manufacturing that's related to the research. So they didn't want just manufacturing plants. They wanted manu uh, manufacturing was okay if it was directly related to the research. So basically they, they said, you know, if you bring in your research staff here, you can bring your manufacturing. Don't bring manufacturing without research. So, um, and that's turned out to work quite well for them. Uh, that's the park. I don't, you're kind of local, and uh, I don't think I need to uh, dwell too much on this, but uh, notice the little black dots within the park. I mean, those are the building footprints, right? So, uh, I mean, that's incredibly low density, and those facilities are incredibly spread out. Um, again, another shot showing the amount of open space. Big hunks of uh, green space. Uh, this is, I believe, the Cisco Systems uh, campus. Uh, big hunks of parking around buildings and then green space. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the EPA uh, facilities. Uh, you know, nice, and uh, they, they make for good photographs, but they don't make for sustainable development, and they don't um, create the kind of edgy, interactive, exciting environment that at least some workers are looking for in today's economy. And this is the, um, the um, uh, biotech center. Uh, beautiful building and uh, really has played such an important role in developing the biotech industry uh, in the research triangle. So just a little bit, I'll go through this fairly quickly on the impacts of the park on the metropolitan area. Uh, lots of spillover effects on surrounding property. Um, as it says uh, down in the second small bullet, uh, there's an additional, and this is somewhat uh, old, I think this is a figure that dates back to about 2005, uh, additional 15 million square feet of floor space within about a five mile radius of the park. Uh, manufacturing plants have followed the R&D operations. So you see uh, in places like uh, Clayton, I think it's Clayton, there's a big uh, pharmaceutical plant. Uh, Holly Springs just got another big uh, Syntex, I think it is, that doing the uh, vaccines. Uh, so a lot of times these manufacturing plants, they may not end up in the park, but they end up in the metropolitan area somewhere. So the, the research is in fact drawing in uh, the manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> and now North Carolina is the third largest biotech center in the Western Hemisphere uh, after California and Massachusetts. So a big change uh, since uh, 19, the 1950s when it was all about agriculture, textiles, and furniture. And you see the increase in the uh, per capita income 
from 93% of, of the national average in to, uh, 1960 up to 107 percent in 2000. That's actually slipped back some uh, si since then. It's also had uh, a, a wonderful impact on the universities. Uh, approximately 25 percent of new RT uh, RTP employees come from one of the local universities. So in that nice, uh, this idea of keeping, of addressing the brain drain actually worked. Uh, a lot of the people that are graduating are going out to work uh, for these companies and are able to stay local. And then um, if you start looking at the other contributions that these park companies have made to the uh, local area, it's incredible in terms of hours donated of staff, in terms of materials donated, in terms of dollar donations. Uh, in a recent year, IBM donated seven million <coughs> to local schools and civic projects. So. Um, <coughs> Needless to say, <coughs> needless to say, uh, the park has had a tremendous impact on the growth and development of this, uh, of this area. So what are the major challenges facing the park today? Um, as, as you all know, the pace of change in business is many businesses just keeps getting faster and faster. I mean, just think about uh, computer technology, right? I mean, a product is out there for six months maybe, and then there's a new product that's better than it, and everybody's saying, oh, I need the new iPhone, or I need the new iPad, the mini iPad, uh, and God knows what's next. Um, so the idea of having big facilities that are owned, that are rigid, Right? Buildings that are rigid doesn't work for a lot of companies in this day and age. They want flex space. They want to be, to roll with the punches, so to speak. If they got a new product, they need a place to put that new product and they don't have time to build. They want something they can move into quickly, which means that they're leasing rather than buying. So that's one uh, challenge that the park has. Again, it goes back to this idea of selling the land and letting people build their own facilities. Uh, the new emphasis on interaction and collaboration, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, the, a lot of businesses now uh, encourage people, rather than discourage people, to talk with uh, other employees. Although, again, I would argue that that's oversold in certain industries that still they don't want you potentially divulging company secrets after your third beer at the bar with somebody. So uh, I, I think uh, you have to be careful how far you take that argument. Um, there's a new emphasis on offering employees amenities, including sustainable environments and, and vibrant environments. Right? Uh, a lot of people are now making decisions in terms of where they live and where they work based on is this, uh, what's it doing to the carbon footprint? They have an environmental consciousness uh, that we could only have dreamed of back in the uh, late 60s when the environmental movement uh, got, got ginned up. Uh, new emphasis on smaller companies. Uh, it used to be, and the park was right in this, it was everybody was what they call buffalo hunting. Everybody was looking for that big company to come in and provide, you know, 1,000 jobs, 2,000 jobs. Uh, well, there are not many of those companies uh, that are footloose and fancy free. And what we see is that some of the startup companies have, in a very short period of time, become big companies. So there are two fantastic examples. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in this area, uh, metro area. <coughs> the first one uh, being quintiles. Well, let me go back. The first one being SAS. So back in the mid-70s, two professors from NC State had developed some statistical software to do some uh, analysis of research data, and they got the idea, well, maybe this is kind of useful to beyond just us and beyond the university, let's start a business and create canned 
software, you know, rather than having to write your own code, we'll write the code and you put in the data and you, you know, hit a couple, you write some syntax and it does all the analysis for you. SAS was born. SAS is now a four billion dollar a year company, uh, thousands of employees, uh, not located in the park, but close to the park, right over in Cary there, and uh, a tremendous impact. So now that I've talked about the uh, impact of NC State, of course, I've got to talk about the impact of UNC. Uh, and here, it's quintiles. So again, a professor uh, in the public health school uh, by the name of Gillings, was doing consulting for companies in the park, and he was helping, helping them develop drug trials. So every new drug, you've got to go through all these trials, right? The experiments, uh, make sure it's not harmful, and so on and so on. And not only that, each country has their own version of a FDA. So all these trials have to be done in countries around the, uh, around the world. So he was and he finally said, look, you know, I, I think I can open up my own com company. So in 1982, he took a leave from the university, and he started Quintiles. Quintiles now is about, again, a $4 billion company. If you go uh, drive through the park, uh, on this side of the park, you'll see a big building right on the edge of the, uh, of the RTP, and it has a big Q on top of it. That's Quintiles. And that's just one of many buildings. And they have, oh, I think, 3,000 employees in that here, and then like something like 20,000 employees around the world. So uh, all this is to say, uh, the idea now is rather than to try to buffalo hunt, not, not that they don't buffalo hunt, they still do, but uh, equally as important is to try to incubate new businesses and grow those new businesses into the next buffalo. And so RTP and many of the other parks have uh, created all these incubator spaces. So it's not just about getting the big companies, it's providing facilities for the small companies. Um, and then also the, the challenge is research parks are being developed all over the country and the world. In fact, uh, I've been over to China several times consulting and we've had delegations of Chinese uh, politicians and business people coming to Duke, where I've uh, been talking with them, me as well as uh, other people, about things like, about economic development, and they get me talking about parks. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to be a new thing in China. Well, phew, nothing uh, could be further from the truth. Uh, and there, because it's such a, a centralized government, uh, you know, the central government says, okay, we're going to invest in a park, and here's where it's going to be, and here's like, you know, $100 million to do it. So uh, they can move very quickly and very aggressively, and so we've got to compete with that. Okay, so all this is, this, none of this is lost on the folks out at the, the Research Triangle Foundation. So they have uh, been working on a new plan for a while. And I'm going to just go over quickly uh, the elements of this new plan. So uh, the key elements are increasing the density of development throughout the park. So right now, it, there's uh, at full build out, okay, full build out of the land given the current uh, zoning and covenants, they could have 26 million square feet of space, developed space. Uh, they want to raise that to 84 million square feet. So, like a 300% increase, huh? Uh, they want to go from 45,000 employees at, at full build out to 150,000 employees. They want to provide more transit options. They want to improve the visibility of the park. Uh, they uh, want to add more amenities in three what are call, called guided development areas, which I'll show you in a second. So basically, uh, these guided development areas, let's see if I can use this fancy pointer here, um, or maybe not. The guided development areas, the larger circle, uh, there's three of them. 
that they uh, have identified in the plan. Yeah, where is it? Ah, okay. Yeah. There are three of them that they talk about in their plan. This is the big gorilla right here, and the one that they're actually starting to move forward on today. Uh, this, this one, they call it the Triangle Commons. So basically, they want to create a new town right in, in the heart of the research triangle. They want to give it uh, a central place. They want to give it an urban environment. Okay? And they want to have it mixed use. They want housing. Of course, a research space would be, would be in there. Um, this was, by the way, I had trouble trying to figure out exactly where this. This is uh, I-40 coming through here. Okay, so and here's the Durham Freeway interchange with I-40, and notice it's very um, fuzzy, right? They don't want to put specific areas on the map because they don't own any of it. They have to convince all the property owners to buy into this, right? And that's part of the problem. They don't own any of this area, so um, they they don't want to have a person show up to a meeting and say, now wait, that's my land. What are you talking, <laughs> you know, what, what are you planning for my land for? So uh, they, they keep it very general at this point. Um, but again, so this, this they want to call the Triangle Commons. It would have research space, it would have retail. So that's the next slide. Uh, it would have retail, it would have a conference center and a hotel. Uh, they're thinking about 1,400 uh, residential units, uh, a science and technology high school, open space, and structured parking, i.e. decks, as opposed to large expanses of, of uh, surface parking the way uh, the park is configured this is all today. In this is all in Durham County. This is all in Durham County. Uh, now, if you look at the park, the the southern maybe quarter of the park is in, Rale is in Wake County. The whole northern part is in Durham County. One, uh, roughly, no, roughly, roughly. I'll come back and I'll show you, I'll show you roughly where that is on the map. Uh, so they're talking about uh, a total of about 7 million square feet of development. So as I said, the park now has 22 million square feet, so they're going to add another third of the floor space just in this one triangle commons, all right? And I'll show you some pictures here uh, of those coming up. These are from, yeah, these are from uh, the developer. So where is this in process? It's still early. They've been, uh, I'll, t I'll mention this in a second. They're um, working on changing the zoning, uh, revising the covenants, and changing the state enabling legislation to allow this to happen because none of this would be allowed under the current uh, zoning covenants or state enabling legislation. Um, but they have gotten a developer to buy, to, to work with them on this. And it's not just any developer, it's the Heinz Company. And the Heinz Company is big time. Big, big time. Uh, international. I first ran into him. I had a uh, marvelous experience taking a sabbatical in Barcelona, Spain, 10 years ago. And I was studying their urban re uh, revitalization experience. And there's the Heinz Company doing this massive, beautiful project on brownfield land. And they totally transformed the section of Barcelona from an area that nobody ever wanted to go to. Uh, to an area that everybody wanted to go to. Uh, so Heinz is, is a serious, serious developer. Uh, they do excellent, high-quality work. And uh, the fact that they're on board leads me to think that this thing is, uh, is probably going to happen and it's going to be done well, at least from a design perspective. I'll, I'll talk about uh, at least one reservation uh, in, a, in a minute. So these are from the Heinz Company uh, graphic artists, 
as to what this thing's going to look like. Now, there's a lot more in, that I could have shown, but I'm going to give you four uh, pieces. Uh, this is a, the, what they call the Convergence Center. Uh, this, this is their um, basically conference center. Uh, and who knows, right? I mean, they're pictures. Uh, but they're thinking big. They're thinking fancy. They're thinking 21st century. They're thinking uh, transformative, right? This is High Street, so they want to have a major boulevard in this commons uh, that has all the elements of an exciting uh, boulevard or, or street in New York City or San Francisco or pick, pick your high dense, highly dense, exciting, bustling city. Uh, so this, this would be, uh, these are concepts obviously of, of what they would like to produce uh, they're going to have a green, so there's the, there's the green, uh, so basically a public square like you find in most uh, European cities. Um, whoops, what did I do? Ah, okay, let me go here. Uh, and then they're going to have uh, some parkland. And uh, they've actually, one of the development partners here is the company, excuse me, that designed the High Line in New York City. Uh, if you haven't, if you haven't, you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the High Line. Go home and Google it. The High Line, New York City, amazing uh, park on an old railroad bed up above the streets, and the landscaping on this thing and the design work on this thing is just mind blowing. Uh, that firm is. Uh, talking with them about participating in this, in this development project. Okay, so let me just go back really quickly to the diagram. And so there's two other ones, as I said. Uh, this is the Park Center. So that's the, origi that's the current Park Center, where the hotel is and the small businesses. So they want to enlarge that. They want to double the density uh, in that Park Center. Um, <clears throat> but make it more for the people in the park rather than create a whole new city. They, they, they talk about it as a service center still. So it would have business services for the companies in the park, that kind of thing. And some retail, but limited retail because you have a lot more retail fairly close by. Uh, this being the railroad tracks, by the way. This is the, um, the Southern Railway. I guess it's all the North Carolina rail, 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 Railway now, but this is where the train runs. And if we get commuter rail, this is where the commuter rail will run, and that's why the, this uh, commons is centered around a commuter rail stop. If we get the light rail, which is even further in the future, the light rail would uh, somehow uh, connect these two, whoops, sorry, somehow connect uh, these two areas, because both of these are supposed to be connected with the light rail. And maybe there would be some kind of a stop here, or maybe the light rail would come up here, or I'm not sure exactly what the route is right now, but uh, both of these are supposed to be accessed by light rail if the light rail uh, ever gets built, particularly be the, the last phase would be, be between Durham and Raleigh, right? So uh, if you kept up with that. Um, so, and then this one here is called Kit Creek. And again, it's a different uh, kind of development model, much uh, less bold. This is the real bold one. Uh, this basically would have a lot of research space, and it would have a small commercial core. Uh, it would have no housing, because apparently there's a big development uh, going in here that's all housing. And this is the edge of the park, so they're basically uh, going to create this symbiotic relationship between the office and retail here uh, and the uh, residential uh, development uh, there. Okay, I'm getting to the end and we can open it up and, and talk about uh, anything I said and anything you want to talk about. So that's the Park Center. Um, went over that, that's the Kit Creek Center with the lakes as a central focus. Uh, briefly, so what are the obstacles? Um, 
again, the RTP, the RTPF, they only own uh, somewhere around 700 acres, and none of those 700 acres are really uh, make up much or, or, or any of the developments, the, the dots, if you will, that uh, you saw on those maps. So basically, uh, they're going to have to convince owners, and at least in the service area, I understand that a number of the owners, uh, some of the big owners, like the hotel, say, well, you know, we're doing fine. Uh, we're making money. Uh, you know, we don't really see a great need to redevelop. Um, so that may change. There may, you know, ownership changes all the time, and they may be convinced, but uh, it, it's not going to be easy um, with so many different landowners involved. Uh, you've got uh, the uncertainty over the uh, public housing, the public housing, public transportation uh, improvements. When, if, you've got uh, restrictive covenants, which are private agreements that you sign a part of the of the sales agreement. You've got uh, state statutes that created the park, and you've got both county zoning, both Wake County and Durham County zoning. Now, they've made changes in all these things already that allow for higher density development, that allow for some mixed use development. So they, they've really moved pretty quickly uh, on, on these. I'm not sure they've made all the changes that they want to make, but they've made quite a few. So um, that, to some extent, is um, they've checked those items off. And then, of course, the big issue uh, always is, is market demand and financing. Uh, obviously, the market has been depressed. Uh, this is a huge development. Whether there's going to be a, enough demand to fill up that, o over what period of time would it be developed, and so on. But that's, uh, that's what they're thinking about. Uh, last couple of slides, lessons. Um, you know, research parks have the potential to have transformative uh, and profound impacts on metropolitan areas. Uh, good park leadership and management are key to long-term success. I was uh, really, frankly, pleasantly surprised with how much uh, on top of these issues the park management was. They understand it's a dinosaur. They understand they've got to make changes. At the same time, keep the current uh, uh, um, clients, the c current owners, happy. Because some of those companies are just fine with the big lots. They want those big lots. Why do they want those big lots? They're working with biological agents. They're working with radioactivity. They're working with caustic chemicals. And the last thing they want is a housing development next to where they're doing this stuff and having the residents say, hey, what is it, what is it that's coming out of that stack over there? Or, you know, what is it that we should be concerned about? So they like that buffer. And so again, uh, many of those property owners are just happy. So they, they have a balancing act and, and they, they understand that. Long-term management funding strategy is needed. Uh, still not quite sure that they've figured out what that's gonna be. Uh, ensure flexible building designs and, and plan for integrated uses. If you were gonna do a new park today, that would certainly be important. Uh, incubating new businesses is equally important as recruiting existing businesses and maintaining the quality of life in an area is critically important to the success of a research park. There's been times when the traffic, for example, on 40 has been so bad, companies have decided, no, I don't want to go there because we're trying to get away from traffic and we don't want to go to another place that uh, our employees are going to be stuck in traffic and complaining and and of course, there's no housing close to the park, so everybody's going to have to commute. Um, so, um, and, and the RTPF people understand that too, and they've been involved in efforts to maintain the quality of life. Uh, and the last two slides I have for you are examples of what happens if you don't pay attention uh, to some of these quality of life issues. Um, this was before they put the third lane uh, going on to 40. Uh, so th I took this picture from the Harrison Avenue Bridge looking toward Raleigh. So now they've got the third lane. It's not quite so bad. I don't drive that way too much. It's probably still backing up a little bit, but I don't think it's, it's this bad. 
But obviously traffic and managing traffic and of course if we ever get a light rail system that will help. It's not going to be the, the uh, end all and be all but it will certainly help. Um, so traffic uh, maintaining a, a high quality of life means keeping the, the traffic, not, not keeping the traffic, that's a wrong way to say it, maintaining mobility, mm -hmm. maintaining mobility whether that's by car, by train, by bus, by bike, uh, or walking, uh, all, all are fine as long as people can get around. And then of course, uh, if you've been around for a while, uh, this was 2007 with our drought, uh, you know, there's big issues with water. And one of the things, uh, of, last thing I'll give a little plug to the book, what you heard tonight uh, basically is chapter two, part of chapter, most of chapter two, or is it three? Uh, no, chapter two in my book. So the other parts of the book deal with the geology of the Research Triangle area. They deal with water issues. I have a chapter on school wars over in Wake County, <coughs> which uh, I was profound. I said at the end of that chapter, I, I, I talked about all the chaos over there. And basically, I, I blame it on the fact that they don't regulate growth over there at all. Mm -hmm. It's like their growth policy is y'all come. Mm -hmm. And so now they're only getting 3,000 new kids a year in their public schools. 3,000 new kids a year. Back in uh, 2007, they had 7,600 kids show up for school in the new school year you need somewhere around 10 new schools to accommodate the kids that are coming in one year. Now, is that crazy? Can't you say, hey guys, we, you know, we're all for growth, but let's manage it. Let's, you know, let's do, let's get 2,000 new kids a year. You know, we don't need 7,000, you know, let's slow it down. Let's slow it down a little bit. Why do we have to have all these people coming at the same time? and the school bond issue and the politics of it, I mean, it's a mess. I think so much of that has to do with the fact that they don't have a decent growth management system. Anyway, thank you for your attention, uh, and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Ooh. All right, yes, sir. We're going to ask you to use ah. the mic. Thank you. A uh, question about symbiotic relationships between residential areas and uh, the park itself. Uh -huh. uh, I think the idea is very flawed, no matter how well intended. And the best example of that is Reston, Virginia, wh which was one of the first planned communities. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody had the idea the people who lived there would work there and oh. vice versa. Yep. It hasn't worked out that way. Mm -hmm. I had a bunch of clients that, uh, in Reston, and none of them lived in Reston. And so the commute was <laughs> terrible. And mm -hmm. it's like RTP. Mm -hmm. And unless they can provide incentives to local residents to work locally and vice versa, it, it'll never work out, or yeah. at least not to the extent that they want. Yeah. Well, I, I, I generally agree with you. Uh, I think times are changing a little bit on that. I think more young people are, are more concerned about, first of all, they're less likely to have children, right? If you look at what's happening with the demographics in our society, uh, the number of households with children is really dropping. So there's a lot of couples with no children. There's a lot of single person households. There's a lot of you know, cohabitation kind of households with no children. And I think they're going to be, they are more careful about where they live and how where they live uh, relates to their quality of life. Now, having said that, as soon as you've got two people in the household, it means you've got two jobs and they're probably in two different locations, right? So may, maybe you can maximize the locational uh, advantage of for one, but it may mean you're halfway in between. So. Go ahead. Well, there, there are some successes, such as San Jose, where people uh -huh. are coming into town to work locally. But that's an urban environment. And the park, for a long time, is going to be closer, more
door is going to resemble Reston a lot more than it's going to resemble San Jose. Yeah. Well, it's got to be uh, uh, both, right? You've got to give people the option to live close. And then you've got to give them transportation options to get from wherever they end up living to where they're working. So that's where the rail system, I think, is going to be, is really important. And I, I get, the, you know, people say it's expensive. It is expensive. Uh, but without a rail system, and, and there's a big issue about, well, should it be uh, bus rapid transit or rail? And bus tra rapid transit is less expensive, but uh, it's, we know that rail concentrates development around the station. We don't know that about bus ra rapid transit. It's not clear that uh, we're going to be able to cluster people around bus rapid transit stops. Uh, it is clear that that happens big time. Of course, you've got to allow it with zoning and so on. But that's already happened. If you look at Durham County and Wake County zoning, uh, they know where their stops are going to be. They've already upzoned a lot of that property. Uh, so we really need that transportation system. And we need housing closer to the employers so that people can have options. Yeah. Um, what's the projected density of the Triangle Commons area as compared to something like Raleigh? Uh, I don't know. Ex I'd have to do the math, which I haven't done. Uh, but they're talking about uh, multifamily residential, primarily. Uh, and they're talking about rental. Uh, I think primarily. Yeah, I'm thinking like from, a, I guess it's kind of a leading question from the perspective of, um, I guess like my age demographic, yep. um, thinking that is this going to end up being a dense suburb or actually a downtown? Well, you know, it's a question of uh, how you define those terms. Uh, it's going to, I would say it's going to be, well, they're talking about 7,000 square feet of developed space. Um, that's a lot of developed, developed space in a fairly small area. Uh, seven, did I say thousand? I meant million. Uh, million. So that's a, that's a fair amount of space. So it should be high density uh, given the uh, hotel, conference center. I mean, it's going to be like a little city. Uh, I think it's going to be like a big neo-traditional community. Um, you know, certainly much bigger than Meadowmont or, uh, or uh, Southern Village or I don't know what may be around here, but uh, it would be a small town. At full development, it would be a small, dense town. Uh, I, I think they would just expect that to come. I don't think they're specifically planning uh, for health care. They'd have plenty of office space for the health care providers to come. Yes. I, I guess I have a related question, um, which is, uh, what's going to happen? Do you see the new commons as, as competing with the downtown redevelopment of Durham here, and also Raleigh, where they've done a lot? I mean, there. I know it's very different, but it is already yeah. a city that has many of the same characteristics, at least in Durham, that yeah. you're talking about building, and it's already an urban area. Yeah. Well, good um, point. And lots of space in the new eastern part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. that, I mean, it's not, obviously not as large. And I don't know about Raleigh, but I would think that there could be Oh, there's plenty of, oh, absolutely. There's plenty of uh, area that they're looking to redevelop uh, on the east side also of, uh, yes. I don't know what it is about the east side, but also on the east side of Fayetteville Street, uh, there's lots of vacant land that they'd like to, and, and underutilized property that they'd like to develop. Yes. As a downtown booster. Know, yes. Downtown, the, the answer is yes. Yeah. It would it would provide additional competition. The question is, uh, would there be enough demand for all that to happen, and and over what period of time, right? Uh, I think I think there's a certain authenticity about certainly downtown Durham, exactly. hands down. I, I I wax eloquently about what's happened in downtown Durham in the book. So I have a whole section on uh, the, the revitalization of downtown Durham, and I you know, spent a lot of time with Bill Kalkoff and others and getting that story and, and, and uh, Jim Goodman and so on. So, uh, I just want to make one comment as someone who, who also loves downtown and lives in downtown. 
uh -huh. when you started on that statement of the, oh, when the question was asked, no, I don't think so, because I think Daniel Cam Durham does have that authenticity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, artists aren't going to be, I don't think, you know, rushing out to RIT. No, it's no. It's going to be a totally different crowd. It's going to be, be, it's gonna be expensive space, too. Yeah. New, so new space, totally and it's going to be upscale space. space. Exactly. Yeah. You know, what, Yeah. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, I agree. I think uh, Durham's going to continue as long as the triangle, yes, as long as the triangle continues to uh, draw people, that Durham is going to get its share, which it, it didn't, right? It used to be everybody was coming to the triangle, and Durham was like the stepsister, like, oh, no, you don't want to go to Durham. And now it's like, oh. You, you, you want to go to Durham, you know, oh, for, for you, for your life, oh, Durham. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes, ma'am. Hi. I was interested in your comments at, towards the end about managing growth and in terms of, um, you know, how many children are in the schools and so forth and how, how do you manage growth? Oh, there, there it goes. <laughs> oh, she's asking... Uh, She's taking me to task for my comment that Wake County ought to manage growth of, of, ch of the children, uh, how many children come, and she's asking, well, how do you do that? Uh, there's a couple ways to do that, uh, and they're in the book. Uh, one is, uh, and uh, I don't want to tout Orange County necessarily, but Orange County has an adequate facilities ordinance. Never, never kicked in yet because we regulate growth pretty carefully, and some would argue too carefully, and it's driving the property values up and the poor people out. So, you know, there's a real balance that you need to try to strike here. But the adequate facilities ordinance gives the school board the right to say, we can't accommodate these kids appropriately in schools. So we, it gives them essentially a veto power over, you know, development. So that's one way to do it. A, a better way to do it, I think, is I think it was pioneered in, in a California town called Ramapo. And what they do in Ramapo, and I, I love this idea, I think it's great. They say, they do a projection and they say, well, what do we think we can accommodate on a yearly basis? You know, how many new houses? And that's not, not only schools, but you're providing water to the houses, you're providing police service, fire service, all that. And they do a projection and they say, let's just pick a number, 2,000 people a year, 2,000 households. We can accommodate 2,000 households. Okay, this year we're going to approve 2,000 units. The word goes out. And here is how we're going to rate these proposals. We're going to look at their environmental sustainability. We're going to look at uh, the affordable housing that's uh, offered. We're going to look at the design to see if the, they're designed in a way that is attractive and uh, in uh, accordance with whatever, you know, I, uh, what would you say, design standards there are in, a, in the particular town. And we're going to have this very rigorous rating system. So we're going to get, you know, you get 9 out of 10 points for this nice design. You get, uh, you know, 7 out of 10 points for 5% uh, affordable housing. Oh, the other, you, you've got 10% affordable housing, we're going to give you all 10 points. And basically, you rate the developments, and you pick the best ones, and you go down the list till you get to the 2,000 and say, okay, that's all we can handle. The rest of you, come back next year. Come back next year with a more competitive proposal. Why not? It's not no growth. It's not no growth. The town is still growing. You're still accommodating uh, new people. Uh, but it's America, you know, and people think that they ought to be able to develop when and what, you know, pretty much whatever they want. And it's been done. Uh, it just takes a lot of political will. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to make a statement. Um, how, what a wonderful idea this RTP was. My husband grew up in South Carolina, went to Clemson University. It was all military, all male. Mm -hmm. So when he and his buddies graduated in 58, they had to go into the military. 
then some of them got out like he did after three years. Couldn't find a job in South Carolina. Didn't want to go too far away. Yeah. So a lot of them came to North Carolina and worked for the R, you know, RTI. Or My husband mm -hmm. worked for RTI. He just retired. Uh -huh. So it was great um, for yeah. a lot of these people in these areas where there were no research uh, companies or chemistry companies. Right. And I worked at Jordan High for 10 years as a secretary. The school was delighted to get all these kids from these well-educated families. Mm -hmm. It made a big difference. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the re Research Triangle Park was a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing I remember was my father and other people at, the, at Duke talking about how they had to sh share a computer that was based out in the Research Triangle Park. Oh, uh, you're talking about, what was the name of that? Uh, yes. Right. Uh, that was sort of, it wasn't, they didn't have to, but uh, each, and he was where? He, you're, he, was, he was at Duke Medical. He was at Duke Medical, yeah. Basically, each of the universities had their own, I'm, I go back that far too, so I remember this. Each of the universities had their own computer systems, and then Tukasi uh, had another computer system that I think was maybe bigger and better. It was, and uh, it was out, oh yeah, they were all linked up. And I'm not sure exactly what the advantages were working out at to working through their computer as opposed to the university computer, but I remember that. Uh, but it didn't hold. It didn't. Right. But still, why would you want to use the Tukasi machine as opposed to your machine on campus? Maybe it was just a, a question of uh, capacity. Maybe it was just ex expanding the capacity so you didn't have to wait as long f to get your job back. Yeah, because I, yeah, yeah. I know that he, they talked about having to go use the computer at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what it was. I mean, this was yeah. late 50s or early yeah. 60s. And I was one of those people that um, was convinced that these uh, microcomputers never catch on. <laughs> Never catch on. No way. This was a toy. My colleagues were messing with these things. It was a toy. You know, how could you possibly? Because I do a lot of data analysis, and in the old days, you know, you needed a. It seems like you needed a big machine to do big data analysis. And the first microcomputers, you, you were limited to like 30 variables and 100 cases, and it was like well, it's a joke. You know, and of course today it's. Unbe unbelievable, unbelievable. Yes? What, if any, Bill, has uh, the companies in RTP and also the foundation? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what role, if any, has the, have the component companies and also the foundation in RTP seen as their role in um, the governments, both county and municipal in the triangle, and um, more particularly in workforce development? Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any direct involvement in that. Uh, I, I am aware that the foundation people coordinate very carefully with the planning staffs for Durham City, Durham at City County, and in Raleigh it's it's Wake. Uh, they 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 coordinate very care carefully with the planning staffs. I don't know what they're doing in terms of workforce uh, training. Uh, I'm not aware. I'm not aware. I've, I haven't heard in all my discussions. I haven't heard of any activities in, in, along those lines. What, where do they go for their workers? Where, where, where are the recruitment strategies? Uh, you know, it's it's out of my uh, field. I think they, you know, they each industry is somewhat different, and you know, they're going through industry channels. Uh, you know, but I I, I can only speculate. I could only spec. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm a city planner, by the way, right? So I tend to focus in on the physical development aspects of these things. Okay, we got we got somebody with the mic over here. Uh, you talked about a couple of decades ago the buffalo hunting or big elephant hunting. Yeah. The IBMs and those sorts of uh, organizations. Yeah. Um, but today, you know, you're looking for, presumably, looking for more small cap or even the startup kinds of companies 
you know, the next Google, the next Facebook. Um, but you haven't said anything about venture capital, and we don't have that kind of uh, venture capital here as compared to Silicon Valley and 128. Do you yeah. see that as a, a missing link, or do you, do you think that's important? Yeah. Let, let me, uh, I'll get to that question in a second, but let me make one other comment. It's not that they are not going after some buffaloes. So if you look at the, the last two big companies that moved into the park, uh, Fidelity and Credit Suisse. Suisse, I don't know how exactly you pronounce that, but those are pretty big companies with thousands of employees that moved into the park. I forget which one of them took over, and this was like, I think the foundation people had a huge sigh of relief. So when Nortel Systems went under, right, they have this big facility out there, big hunkin' building, built by Nortel, for Nor Nortel, and for Nortel's business. Uh, you can't easily subdivide it. Uh, it's, it's what it is, and it's fixed. And they were really worried about having that thing just sit vacant for a long period of time. I think it's Fidelity came and said, that's for us. And for whatever, you know, it just worked for them, and they moved into it. So they're still after the buffaloes. Uh, to some extent to replace the ones that are kicking the bucket, <laughs> right? Uh, in terms of the startups, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, venture capital is critical. And I've got some statistics in the book about what the venture capital uh, is um, uh, in this area, some of the venture capital companies in this area. We certainly have it, but it's nothing like the scale of the venture capital dollars in the two places you mentioned. And probably uh, the, the other one that is very, very competitive is um, uh, Austin, Texas. Also, lots and lots of uh, companies, lots and lots of uh, venture uh, capitalist funding uh, companies. But we're not shabby when it comes to venture capital. I mean, there are a number of venture capital companies that are located here and focus in on businesses that are being created here. The other thing that's going on, as I mentioned, that originally the universities were very skeptical about getting their hands dirty with this uh, applied research stuff, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, there are all kinds of incentives for faculty to uh, commercialize their work. The universities help them patent it. The university gets a cut of it, um, license, patent it, license it. Um, and um, th they have incubator facilities on some of the campuses. Well, I mean, the, the really exciting new version of the RTP is Centennial Campus. Hey, I hate to say that. Being a Carolina guy, I hate to say that, but uh, that, ca that campus model is exciting. Uh, even though Red Hat decided to move downtown, I think they'll fill, fill that space pretty quickly. And what's different about it is, is first of all, it's mixed use. So there's still, the housing part is still small, but it's there and it, it, it will uh, grow and develop. But it's also mixed use in terms of, you've got computer science buildings there and also you had Red Hat right there. So you got the students and you got the employers and they're working together and you know, that's the, talking about a collaborative model uh, that's an exciting model, and, and I think you'll see more parks like that. Let me, let me go back here since uh, we'll This is our last question. Wedding anniversary. I married a man. I came down from the University of Delaware, whom I had met before, met him before at Duke. Uh -huh. And we married, uh, and so we lived the research triangle development. He uh, finished, uh, completed his PhD in chemistry at Duke, and was uh, uh, had a number of uh, possibilities for, for employment, but because he loved, he was a North Carolinian and had so much tar on his heels, <laughs> he just couldn't <laughs> leave North Carolina. Yeah. And uh, nor thinking that I wouldn't want to either, and that's true. So we, uh, we uh, <laughs> remained here in North Carolina, but mm -hmm. he worked with the first company in Research Triangle Park, mm -hmm. which was ChemStrand. Mm -hmm. Yes. A fabulous yes. company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabulous yeah. company. 
Yep. They brought, an, they built an entire village or town um, or, or development for these people. Parkwood came oh, about. Oh, really? As a that was built that, for Kemp's? Oh, I had no here. idea. It would never have existed, probably, or oh. certainly as it, as it did immediately. Uh -huh. And uh, then it became uh, Monsanto, bought them out, another fine company. Mm -hmm. When they decided to leave, we had children at Jordan High School and didn't want to leave that area for sure, and was hired by IBM. What a glorious career could yeah. anyone ask for. Yeah, yeah. And we have had an <laughs> RTP. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to have to stop with that all right. one. Um, all right. We have a few books left. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Please grab an evaluation on, the, on your way out because we like to know what kind of programs you like to have, and we really do pay attention. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Rohi a big round of applause. Thank you very much.